I think also let's name the unwritten family rules, right? Those kinds of rules mm. are so powerful, carry so much power, especially when they were so kind of deeply ingrained and operative as children. It is not uncommon for us to see adult survivors, you know, 30, 40, 50 years old, who, you know, are for the first time in their life coming to the realization that I don't have to go sit beside my offender at Thanksgiving dinner. Um, I think it's so important to acknowledge that harm comes not just from uh, what was done, but what wasn't done. Yes. Um, and understanding that the absence of protection and acknowledgement and support um, can also be a really struggle, a really big struggle for survivors of sexual trauma, especially in faith communities. Um, you know, sometimes people think of not going to a family gathering or not going to a, a worship service as a form of defeat or giving in. Um, we really, those of us who work directly with survivors really embrace the philosophy of empowering survivors to do what they need to do, um, to, to take choice back for themselves, mm -hmm. the choice to stay or go, the choice to um, maybe go to this service instead of this service or get together with family members in this way if that way is harmful or, or, or scary or unhelpful, right? your standing spiritually doesn't change is it imperiled uh, right because you don't do this um, or that hello welcome to our november grace live conversation my name is zane um and I am not Pete. Uh, Pete, unfortunately, has have has been having a bad cough, so I'm stepping in to uh, host today's Grace Live conversation. We have two amazing guests, uh, Laura Teen and Carrie Nettles, um, and really excited to have them on um, for this program. Um, but today we're going to be talking about caring for others uh, and caring for ourselves and caring for others um, and how this is an important thing to do during the holiday season. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to share a little bit about Grace. Uh, so Grace is a nonprofit. We, we work to empower faith communities to recognize, prevent, and respond to abuse. So we want churches to understand what abuse is like, how it works, how um, and things that we, we don't understand about abuse. Um, and then we're also working towards prevention. What do, how can churches uh, safeguard those who are most vulnerable within their communities? We do that through training, policy review, and consultations. And then, of course, response, uh, which is how, how do churches address uh, past issues of abuse um, and helping them walk through things that doesn't re-traumatize those who've been harmed, uh, but holds offenders accountable, changes those things within their cultures, um, that we're lacking uh, and starts to, to build trust with their community and safeguard those who are most vulnerable. Uh, so that's what we do, uh, but we also provide public education in and, and various forms, and this is one of them, our Grace Life Conversation, and we're, we're delighted to, to get into this topic today as we, we're on the, the verge of kind of the holiday season. For a lot of us, it feels like it's been going on for a long time, um, uh, but but you know, Thanksgiving is just around the corner next week and we have Christmas coming up and all the other the activities in between with friends and family and um, just in our own community. So um, uh, first I'd like to introduce our amazing speakers. Uh, you may have uh, seen them before, uh, Laura Teen. She is uh, a Grace board member. She's actually our board chair. Uh, she helps uh, in so many ways our, our organization uh, operate and run smoothly from a, a governance standpoint, but she is also uh, a clinical, um, a licensed. I'm going to let you, Laura. <laughs> I'm going to let you introduce yourself because I'm going to botch uh, your okay. official title. So go ahead. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Laura Teen, and happy to be here with everyone today. Excited for this conversation. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker in the state of South Carolina. 
um, and an adult therapist um, at the Julie Valentine Center, which is the um, Child Advocacy Center and Rape Crisis Center serving um, the community where I live um, and some surrounding communities as well. So thanks, Zane. Yeah, you're welcome. And our other guest is Carrie Nettles. She's also been a guest on previous Grace Lab conversations. Uh, Carrie, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. I'm Carrie Nettles. I also work here at the Julie Valentine Center alongside Laura Teen. I serve as our chaplain and as a uh, faith community liaison and educator. So I will go out into the field here in the community and work with faith communities to teach them prevention education and um, how to have better policies, how to be aware of predatory red flags um, and keep everyone safe. Wonderful. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Laura, for introducing yourselves. Um, so let's jump right into the topic. Um, so our first question is, uh, and we actually want to open this up to um, to the, the people who are participating today. Um, and, and so the question is, you know, what are those things about the holidays that are the most challenging? Um, as we think about it, it could be uh, different for each individual person. Um, but we would invite those who are here with us to just leave a chat, leave a comment. Hey, what are those things that are very challenging for you uh, during the holidays? And feel free, if you don't want to comment, please don't. <laughs> you do have that, you have that option. Um, and of course, we, we're not going to be able to unpack everything about these comments and about those particular stressors during the holidays. Um, but, but we wanted to open it up as we kind of talk through this to hear what you guys think about the holidays and why it's difficult. Um, but Laura, uh, Carrie, do you, does one of you want to start about just, just some of the challenges that people face during the holidays? Go ahead, Laura. Sure. So um, as some of you consider commenting and sharing with us some of the things that you find difficult around the holiday season, um, I think there are a lot of things that can create barriers or difficulties for survivors of trauma. Um, Carrie, in a minute, is going to acknowledge some of those barriers related to particularly to the faith community. Um, but from an individual standpoint, from a, from a knowing and connecting with yourself standpoint, um, you know, there's a lot going on for survivors um, neurobiologically. A lot of things that can feel overwhelming, a lot of things that can feel unsafe, particularly if a survivor was um, harmed and abused um, over the holiday season by a family member who um, they share traditions with over the holiday, or, um, or maybe in such a way that, uh, especially this time of year is, is like the, the light and the timing has shifted. People are experiencing some seasonal affective things as well. All of that's kind of coming, crashing all in at one time, right? And so some of the, some of the things that might be triggering to a person could happen this time of year. Some of the people they see might be triggering to them some of the things that they're taking in through the senses, the sights, the sounds, the things that they taste, uh, a lot of different elements of the season are sensory oriented, right? So you can't control what song you hear at CVS when you go and you pick up your prescription, but it's often Christmas music this time of year, right? Or, um, but all of those things, when um, those are overwhelming for a person who's experienced trauma can create a lot of overwhelm. Um, and that overwhelm can manifest itself through um, that person feeling like they need to isolate or shut down, or they may kind of power through that. Um, it can also look like a person who was raised in an environment where there was a lot of kind of chaos and overwhelm growing up. Maybe they feel really used to operating in that way. Um, and so the, the seasonal um, busyness actually feels comfortable for them, but maybe they're at, at a point where they're more alone this time of year and that feels unsafe um, and unhelpful to them. So there's a lot of different ways that um, what we encounter during the holidays um, from a cultural standpoint, um, from an individual and family standpoint um, can be really challenging in addition to the normal stresses of thinking about all the logistics of going places and doing things and preparing and gift giving and all of that. Absolutely. We also know that the majority of folks experience sexual assault by someone known to them, mm. whether that is immediate family or um, religious community neighbor, um, someone who is a known uh, 
person in the larger family system. So as the holidays approach and we tend to gather as these larger family systems um, or faith communities more frequently than usual, um, it's not uncommon for, for survivors to feel that increased anxiety or fear, um, not feeling safe. Um, even if sometimes because their offender is at the dining room table, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes it's uh, maybe what they're feeling is connected to the fact that their family wasn't believing or supportive when they did um, tell what they experienced. And, and these are the people that I love and I feel conflicting feelings about sitting at the table with them. I would add as well for children, um, you know, when we get into the holiday season, there's a lot that's changing about, you know, your family schedule and routine, a lot of maybe some things that feel unpredictable to children. And maybe, um, maybe a child in your family actually hasn't even made a disclosure of abuse yet, but they are feeling really overwhelmed by going to the grandparents' home or, or to the church Christmas Eve service or somewhere else because of who's going to be there and what they're afraid of and what might happen. And so sometimes we see those fears um, and that lack of feeling safe come out through behavior that might irritate us a little bit, right? Like, why are they being so, you know, resistant or difficult or frustrating? Um, and it doesn't mean that people who exhibit those behaviors are people who have been abused, but maybe there's a reason for those behaviors that, um, that has not yet been determined. Um, but children are also just generally a population that don't have a lot of control over their lives. Right. So when we get to the holiday season and routines are off, people are staying up later, they're visiting people, they're going here and there. Um, they may just feel generally that that feels unstable and unsafe. So um, there are a lot of families that um, do go with the flow and there's a lot of different things, but just maybe keep in mind that especially if a child has experienced trauma from a family member over the holiday season, um, just to kind of be mindful of how that might affect how tired they are and how safe they do or don't feel and how that might even come out through behaviors. Absolutely. Okay. Wow. Thank you so much. That's really, that's really helpful um, just to understand and unpack the just the holiday, the realities of the holiday season and how they can impact people, especially those who've experienced trauma and abuse. Um, so as we think about this time of year, as we think about ways that, um, that, that it's has an extra level of, of um, challenge, especially those who've experienced trauma, um, what would you what would you say as someone who's going through that or about to face a lot of these uh, additional stressors and, and um, <clears throat> challenges? Um, you know, how can they think about self care? What are some themes that will kind of help them just process and plan maybe as they think about the next couple months? Yeah, Carrie, do you want to start off this time? Sure. I, um, I often um, recommend to clients that I work with that they can create a little miniature self-care kit, right? Like just about the same as the size of a makeup kit or makeup bag. You know, you can have some essential oils in there, some peppermints or hard candies of different flavors, um, a fidget or two, you know, maybe one that's soft and squishy, comforting, um, something to, that does engage all five of your senses because, um, you know, the, the trauma triggers will take us out um, of our regulation um, via our five senses and our five senses are also what's going to help us bring us back down and, and ground again. Um, so if you're preparing to go to the in-laws or someplace where you have a little anxiety about how well you're going to do, um, how, what might come up for you, how you might find yourself feeling, um, having a little tiny self-care bag like that can be helpful. In addition to, you know, reminding, set an alarm to remind yourself to drink water and eat a little protein, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, a really significant part of self-care, which is a very proactive aspect of life um, that sometimes we don't always think about is managing expectations mm -hmm. um, about ourselves and about what's going to happen and giving ourselves permission um, 
to have some choices in front of us about what we're going to do and what we're not going to do, and then setting those boundaries accordingly. For instance, um, you know, managing expectations around gift giving. So for some um, survivors of trauma, gift giving was a part of the grooming yes. that they experienced. And so when it comes to giving gifts and receiving gifts, that can actually be really difficult, right? Um, it can also um, be a way that some survivors feel they need to gain a sense of approval and love and admiration and validation. And so sometimes um, we might spend more than is really healthy or helpful in an effort to gain that approval or to prove love in some way. And maybe that was used for and against us, you know, in childhood. And so we want to just acknowledge the fact that that can be a, a, at work for folks, whether they recognize that or not, and to give yourself permission to think, you know, I don't have to prove my love to another person by giving them things. And if receiving things from others is challenging, like thinking about ways to acknowledge that the gift I'm receiving from this person is different than what was used against me um, when I was young. But I just want to, especially, I think expectations around gift giving can be something to think about for individuals. Um, and then also expectations around how you, much you are or are not going to be participating yes. in seasonal activities at the individual level, at the family level, the workplace level, the church, you know, community wide, giving yourself options to opt out and opt in when, when it's healthy for you, right? Um, taking a separate vehicle in case you're overwhelmed and you need to leave early, setting a boundary about, Hey, I'm going to come a few minutes early, but then I'm probably going to leave after about an hour. Um, just thinking about ways to offer your body and bring a little respite, um, and giving yourself that adaptability of, Hey, I'll go. And if I feel good about this and things are going well, I might stay longer, but to not, um, to not feel like you're obligated to do that if that makes sense. Lara, I think, I think also let's name the unwritten family rules, right? Those kinds of rules mm. are so powerful, carry so much power, especially when they were so kind of deeply ingrained and operative as children. It is not uncommon for us to see adult survivors, you know, 30, 40, 50 years old who, you know, are for the first time in their life coming to the realization that I don't have to go sit beside my offender at Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. I can actually choose not to go to grandma's house for Thanksgiving dinner. You know, like mm -hmm. um, those unwritten family rules are really the hardest for us to break, even when we're conscious of the power that it has over us. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of coming to an awareness of those and being able to give yourself permission, or maybe you can't, I'll give you permission. You don't have to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can do something different. Mm -hmm. Carrie okay. said, you don't have to go. So you yeah. can always say Carrie Nettle said, right. And acknowledging also what's here in the chat that it's not just simply about being in an environment with people who potentially, you know, were abusers, but those who support abusers or who have refused to acknowledge the harm, the same kind of managing expectations and boundaries goes to interacting with those groups of people and being there. And um, I think it's so important to acknowledge that harm comes not just from uh, what was done, but what wasn't done. Yes. Um, and understanding that the absence of protection and acknowledgement and support, um, can also be a really struggle, a really big struggle for survivors of sexual trauma, especially in faith communities. Um, so go ahead, Zane. Can I just piggyback off that, that glass comment? So, you know, for, for survivors of abuse and those who've experienced trauma, as it kind of intersects with a faith community, um, you know, in, in our work with Grace, we, we see a lot of folks who are still unsure about their relationship with their church, about their own faith. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, as you think about um, offering advice to people, you know, when around a season where there's so many things wrapped up in faith and spirituality and expectations to go to church and, you know, mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z, you know, how would you help them think through that and navigate that? 
a lot of the shoulds, it sounds like of the mm-hmm. season. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. encourage people not to should on themselves. <laughs> Truly. Mm-hmm. Um, but so- socially, we are we are wired with a lot of expectations, right? Mm-hmm. Um Christmas, family Christmas gatherings are supposed to look like this. And I know that's true because Hallmark and Coca-Cola and whatever have told me it's supposed to look like this, right? Um, or or even Norman Rockwell, right? Um, and then we also get those messages even from within the church. If you're not going to Christmas Eve service or you're not going to uh, candlelight mass or, or whatever is in your tradition. Um, sometimes the message that you get from your church family is you're bad for not going. Mm -hmm. Um, and I see here in the chat that, um, you know, sometimes people think of not going to a family gathering or not going to a, a worship service as a form of defeat or giving in. Um, we really, those of us who work directly with survivors really embrace the philosophy of empowering survivors to do what they need to do, um, to, to take choice back for themselves, Mm -hmm. the choice to stay or go the choice to, um, maybe go to this service instead of this service or get together with family members in this way. If that way is harmful or, or, or scary or unhelpful, right. Um, you don't, have to do um, these unwritten family rules or church rules. Um, you are allowed to do what your spirit needs you to do mm-hmm. to take care of yourself. Yeah, you're not a failure for taking mm-hmm. care of yourself, mm-hmm. right? Okay. Um, and self compassion, I think, is a really big component of that. And it can be, it can take a, a little while, and it can be really feel really uncomfortable to to have compassion toward yourself in those moments when you feel overwhelmed or, or like, oh, I really wish I could be at this Christmas program because my niece is in it or, you know, X, Y, Z, um, situation. Um, but being able to acknowledge that you're meeting a need that you have, um, and it's a really important one. Um, and that that's okay. Is, I think wow. part of okay. part of acknowledging and that your standing spiritually doesn't change. Is it imperiled? <laughs> right. Because, you don't do this, um, or that. And, you know, Carrie, you've already even talked kind of briefly, like, what does it look like to maybe think about creating a new tradition, right? Part of redeeming and creating and making something new could be, Hey, these things hold trauma for me, but it doesn't mean I don't get Christmas. It doesn't mean I can't celebrate. It doesn't mean I can't acknowledge something. Um, what are, what do you think are some examples of that? So for, you know, let's take the example of someone who grew up um, experiencing child sexual abuse at the hands of a priest, right? For them, a high liturgy smells and bells uh, type of worship service might be really triggering or at least activating. It might because of the connection to the offender or that season of life, right? Um, it's not uncommon for folks who grew up worshiping in this way to find themselves going to a faith community that worship looks and sounds very different. You know, maybe there are jeans and drums and not candles and incense. And and then we see that in the other direction too. You know, people who experienced abuse in this kind of context may find um, this is a better way of worshiping for them, a way that doesn't look or sound or smell this way. And some people need to leave altogether. Um, and that's okay too. God is also beyond the walls of the church. Um, I would say, I would also encourage people to remember as well that there is, there's a season to things too, right? Just because I can't go now doesn't mean Mm -hmm. I will never be able to go. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, And that's kind of, it's not unlike someone who's dealing with, um, the grief of, of a loved one dying right? Those first few holidays after someone dies, look and feel a lot different. Um, survivors who are, who are processing the grief of what happened recently or long ago are in that same season of grieving and lamenting what was lost, what is changed forever now. And that's okay. That's appropriate place to be. Mm-hmm. When you're thinking of creating a new tradition, 
I would encourage everyone just to remember that, you know, sometimes the overwhelm that you experience by engaging in some seasonal activities um, comes because of the emotional bandwidth that it takes to constantly be on the lookout for danger. Like your nervous system is doing it, whether you're like, you're conscious of it or not. Yes. Some of you are like, I'm very conscious of it. You know, you're like always looking behind you and positioning yourself in the room so you can see the exits and, and definitely like trying to keep, make sure that the person that you're most worried about isn't anywhere near the kids, um, you know, in various stages of people deciding whether or not to even go at all. Right. Um, but it does take a lot out of you to constantly have to monitor yourself and everybody else. That's exhausting. It, it's exhausting. And so, um, you know, remembering that sometimes a new tradition could be recovery um, after, hey, I am going to engage in this, but I'm going to give my body and my brain and my family, you know, a day or two after these events or these um, celebrations to just have some downtime and the people we can sleep when we need to sleep, we can hydrate, we can do the things we need to recover. I don't think sometimes we estimate how much recovery you need at the end of a trip, at the end of an interaction, at the, at the end of a very difficult, um, time with yeah. others for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. New traditions can be so creative though. There's, there's a lot you can do Friendsgiving, all of those kinds of things. Yeah. I love See? that. Yeah, so the themes I hear, and I just want to kind of recap a little bit of what you said is, you know, one, have a lot of compassion for yourself, mm -hmm. um, that there's going to be a lot of things, there's going to be a lot of challenges, there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, additional stressors in, uh, during this time, and to, to find ways to give yourself a little bit extra compassion. Um, don't should on yourself. Uh, take away those expectations was the, the second one is, is you know, all this, I, I've got to do this. This is important. My family's depending on this. And, you know, the pastor said this and X, Y, and Z, and really examining those expectations and, and um, thinking through um, what's going to help you <laughs> during this holiday season and how can you best care for yourself and care for others during this holiday season? Um, and, and then the new traditions. I love that. I think thinking through those traditions that, that make sense um, moving forward and mm -hmm. that, that, that give you a better sense of, of, of uh, spiritual connection or kindness uh, or goodness towards uh, your fellow human being. And, um, I think, um, is there anything you would add or you want to talk more about any of those self-care themes? You can, you can get creative too. So let's take, for example, um, you know, someone who is a survivor of an offender who practiced putting them on their lap right? So now you're grown and you have children and you want to, you want those Santa pictures with the kids, right? But you feel very nervous about the possibility of them sitting on Santa's lap. You have permission to get creative and change it up, you know, look for places where there are different kinds of Santa picture options, or, you know, walk up there with them and say, Hey, can the kids stand in front of you or beside you for the picture? Mm -hmm. You get to take back that kind of power and choice um, as you seek to meet the needs of, I want to keep this, but I want to do it in a safe way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think also, um, make safe people part of new traditions. So if you yes. have a friend or a support person um, that you can help bring into the mix on the new tradition, you could even help them or help, you know, make them a part of your, um, of your plan for, Hey, you know, if you don't hear from me by this date in the holiday season, please reach out or, Hey, I need you to call me an hour into Thanksgiving. So I have a reason, <laughs> you know, co co-conspirator, mm -hmm. maybe uh, there, there are lots of ways. Um, somebody who knows you and, and you don't even have to have told them your whole story, but just mm -hmm. knows that, um, Hey, you might need a little bit of respite. Maybe, um, they could make cookies with you, or you could invite safe people into your traditions as mm -hmm. a part of redeeming some of the ones that became unsafe or unhealthy over time. Um, and, and enlisting that support from them. Um, but then also, you know, support even from your community, which I know we're going to talk about in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. 
Awesome. So it made me think about something my wife and I um, found actually really helpful about having a dog. Mm. Um, is the ex the when we just needed time away, especially during family gatherings, um, just oh, our dog needs a walk. <laughs> And so we would go together and walk our dog mm -hmm. and just be able to like, oh my goodness, this is really hard for me in this moment. Mm -hmm. um, and we would be able to process things during that time. And I don't, I know like, hey, don't just go buy a dog, but maybe there's something similar. Yes. Uh, sorry, that's not helpful for everyone. But I just remember- It's, it's thinking, time to like, go get some steps in. Everyone yeah. like, okay, how many yeah. steps do we need? Oh, time to go get some steps, you know? <laughs> Set your watch to beep an hour into the meeting or something, I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's flip kind of flip the perspective a little bit. So, you know, as um, you know, one of our hopes is that people tune in who are faith leaders um, that, that are very, they want to learn and grow about this issue. We had a, um, a comment in the, in the, in the chat about, you know, the reality that churches aren't doing a good job really facing this issue that they sometimes gloss over it. And, and it makes it even harder for survivors um, in faith communities to be parts of those faith communities because there's just a lack of failure to address this, to be sensitive to it, um, and to care well for those in their communities. Um, and so I guess the question now is if for faith community leaders tuning in or hearing this on a YouTube channel later, what would be, um, you know, it's just some helpful guidelines, tools, ideas um, as people who are setting up environments um, where there will be those who have experienced trauma, who've experienced abuse in their communities. Um, you know, what does that look like? What's that effort look like? How does that, what do they need to understand? Uh, there's a lot in that question, but, um, the, you know, um, I think you guys are kind of understanding my question, but does anybody want to take that? Lara, how do we, how do we phrase it when we do our so supporters of survivors, your loved one's distress, your loved one's season of, or your parishioners season of, um, spiritual wilderness or desert season is not proof of their sin. Mm -hmm. It is a normal and predictable part of grieving and healing. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're not going to confront it as though it is sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think acknowledging, um, I noticed a comment here about um, churches addressing and pastors addressing the fact that um, hidden abuse has been a part of the lives of Christians around the world and, and in many communities around the world. Um, I think at the bare minimum, acknowledging from, a, from the pulpit, which I think says a lot, that this is not a season that is full of joy and peace and merry and merriness and light for everyone. Um, and acknowledging, because because we know the statistics say that a fourth of the congregational, uh, in, in congregational life, a fourth of the women will have experienced um, sexual trauma by the age of 18, and at least, at least, um, you know, one in six men, right? And so we, in every congregation, there will be people, uh, and maybe not all traumatized within a faith community, you know, maybe not all struggling with the holidays, but I think acknowledging at the holidays that this could be a concentrated time of difficulty and harm. Um, acknowledging that I think from the pulpit is, I think could be really significant um, in addition to other things, but I think, I think that speaks and says a lot. In the Christian tradition, we affirm that confession is good. Um, which means that we pastors and clergy standing up in pulpits or hopping on Facebook lives can admit and confess that historically the church has handled um, sexual abuse cases poorly. We can admit that we can confess it and that's good for us. It's good for others to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, and my role as a chaplain, um, I will, respond to the individual in front of me and say, you know, I'm sorry. I'm not saying I'm sorry because I'm the one who sexually assaulted them. I'm saying I'm sorry as a representative of the clergy, as a leader of um in Christianity, that was wrong. And I'm sorry. That should not have happened to you. Mm -hmm. And respecting the boundaries that you see 
being placed, um, you know, by those in your community who are saying, you know, I, I would like to be, or maybe I wouldn't like to be at the Christmas Eve service, um, um, and not making an issue of a congregant's participation at that time of year, especially, um, especially if you don't know about their background and history. But if you do, just recognizing that um, you can invite their participation, you can invite their um, their reflection, their uh, their presence uh, there without, um, but also respect the boundaries they might be putting into place. I mean, some people might wish and like, Hey, I wish I could do this specific reading at this particular service. I would love to do that. And asking that of them would be meaningful. Um, and at maybe asking someone who declines that is also meaningful when you respect that boundary. Yes. Right. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit, Carrie, about blue Christmas and kind of a little bit about how that can potentially be an aspect of acknowledging, grieving, honoring what's going on for folks um, in a Christian setting? Absolutely. Um, so there are churches and even, you know, um, hospitals, for example, where um, the spiritual care department, the chaplaincy department will host a, what is called either a blue Christmas or a longest night service. And it is usually on or around the winter solstice, the longest night, um, to represent that there are times where we feel um, that the light is gone and it's not coming back. Mm. Um, and we can honor that deep loss and deep, deep grief. Um, because, you know, sometimes people have loved ones who have died on the holiday, or this is their first major holiday without their loved one. Um, so grief does coexist at the same time that the, the church is celebrating new life and joy. Um, and we can have these uh, worship services like a blue Christmas or a longest night service um, that are specifically set aside with um, specific readings and prayers and songs that not unlike a memorial service or a funeral that acknowledges um, not everybody is feeling the joy of Christmas um, that some of us are really sad and really longing for that day when pain and suffering will be no more. Mm. So you can, um, you know, look around for if you're comfortable um, being in a church, um, there may be Blue Christmas or Longest Night services near you. Um, if you're not, um, I don't know, did we did we tape that one last year? We didn't, did we? So. Well, but, but we do have our outline. We do have our outline and we honor your loss and grief in the season of great joy. Mm -hmm. And um, for those who can't find a blue Christmas service, um, you know, I'll work with Carrie and Laura to maybe make that resource available mm -hmm. um, for our listeners and share it uh, either via social media or on our website um, so that people have that resource and maybe can do a self-guided um, Blue Christmas um, just to, to have that spiritual connection that really fits with maybe where they are during the season. And, um, yeah, um, you, you even if you want, and, and especially for people who don't feel safe um, or, or comfortable going back into um, a church building, for example, um, you're allowed to create little rituals for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's lighting a candle every night. Maybe it's saying not a scripted prayer from the church, but um, something from your heart that is organic to your deep sadness, your great hope, right? Mm. Um, I would absolutely encourage you to come up with rituals like that, that meet your spiritual needs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And engaging the five senses to, um, in that with music or lighting a candle, um, maybe having some incense or, you know, something lit that will promote a safe scent. So you can create a lot of scent affiliations since our 
sense of scent smell is one of um, the biggest things that brings back vivid memory, right? Um, and so as you're creating your new traditions, if you can associate a scent that feels safe, that feels calming and soothing to you, that can also be um, a part of that, you know, maybe for some people, the smell of an old church building with, you know, hymnals that have been there for a while and kind of even the air in a space can be, can be hard. Um, and I think everybody can maybe recall what it's like to go to a person's house and be like, oh, that smells like grandma's house or that smells like this place or that place. And sometimes those bring good affiliations and sometimes they don't. Um, so I think even sense of smell incorporating that into um, your rituals can be really helpful for your brain as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left or so. If people want to leave a question um, for Laura or Carrie, um, we'd love to get to that, but I'd have a question just kind of relating to this last, um, this last idea of faith community leaders, you know, what about individuals who have a friend or a family member? We've talked, we've talked a lot in the beginning and, and throughout, I think a little bit about this, but <clears throat> you know, um, what does that environment look like or that space that we need to, we should think about creating for those, um, you know, maybe it's not words, maybe it is words of encouragement. I'm not sure exactly, but I'd love for you to help think through just someone who they know they have someone in their life that they interact with regularly. Um, um, you know, what would you say to them as they, they want to be careful, not, I guess they want to be sensitive and, and helpful and encouraging um, to those who've experienced uh, trauma. Mm. I would say patience first, mm. right? That like, healing and grieving, um, don't happen on a, on a linear timeline that we can sort of, um, predict or prescribe, I guess I should say, um, that it, it takes what it takes, um, as long as it takes, and there will be, um, ebbs and flows. There will be times when we feel like someone's doing really well, and then, they themselves might be judging themselves They're like, oh, I somehow like fell off the healing wagon, you know, that now I'm sad again. Well, that's okay. That's normal and predictable. Um, and so the loved ones who are in their life with them need that sort of same awareness and recognition that, mm -hmm. um, that if they seem like they're doing worse after a season of doing better, that's not anybody's failure. That's not anybody falling off the wagon. Um, that's just the nature of healing and grieving. Um, so I would say patience above all. Yeah, I'd say be flexible in offering choices. Um, and maybe they decline all the choices you give them and that's okay. Um, maybe they say, hey, I am gonna be there for X, Y, Z celebration, but then on the day of they cancel last minute. I think it is frustrating, you know, sometimes when we need head counts for things and we're counting on things and we're disappointed, but just remember that like our disappointment is about our response to the loss of them not being there, but it's not indicative of them as a person. Um, so we can have that disappointment that we won't get to see them, but also acknowledge that they're doing what's best for them. Yeah. Um, and then for you to even acknowledge that to them in a text, like, Hey, we're, we'll really miss you, but, um, respect that you need your time. Um, and just let us know if you change your mind in the other direction, we're happy to have you if you change your mind. Um, those kinds of things can let the person know that, um, that you're respecting their boundary, that you're being flexible, that they have choices, um, that can be really meaningful, um, to, to survivors of trauma for sure. Well, to anybody, right. <laughs> it can be meaningful to anybody. Well, and um, then like that offering that choice back to them. Yeah. How can we get together? You know, what would be helpful for you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What way would you like to celebrate this that feels safe? Right. And remembering that, you know, we're not here to rescue anyone. We're not here to rescue Christmas for somebody. We're not here to rescue. We're here to be safe connected calm presence um, for others who are feeling unsafe and um, who need connection and who need calm. And if we feel like it's our responsibility to like make this season great for them, uh, <laughs> first of all, it's, it's, that's not within our control, um, but it also takes power away from them um, and where they're at right now. So I think just being that safe, calm presence that shows up and shows up and shows up 
um, is incredibly powerful in and of itself. Yeah. And that non-judgmental presence, yes, right? Non-judgmental presence. The yeah. one that acknowledges that holidays may look different for, for a period of time. Um, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be bent out of shape and angry at you if you don't come to my Friendsgiving. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's really good. Um, really good. Just thinking about being a calm presence that just shows up um, and is patient. And um, so, so I don't see any questions from our um, from our audience. But um, if you'll have anything else uh, you'd like to share, uh, last minute thoughts or maybe questions for each other. Um, um, you know, we have a few more minutes, so let's. Mm. So I will say this for the tail end of the holiday, as people get toward New Year's, there's a lot of New Year's resolutions that kind of tend to bubble up for folks. They're like, oh, we ate so much over Christmas and now we need to like not eat ever again. You know, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of, a lot of um, loaded, layered (laughs) um, feelings and thoughts that go into even thinking about resolutions. And so you know, when it comes to eating, when it comes to nutrition, when it comes to depriving yourself and fasting and different things, whether it's, you know, not just this time of year, but new years or Lent or other things, um, you know, just keep in mind that some of those aspects of spiritual traditions and resolutions and things like that can also come with, um, some really unhelpful, unhealthy behaviors that people feel obligated toward. Um, and so for, whether, you know, you're thinking about trying to like self-improvement in the new year or over Lent fasting, like fasting is not going to be healthy from a, if you're fasting from food for people who have struggled with eating disorders, right. And body image, um, new year's resolutions around exercise activity is good. It's healthy moving reminds us that we're not stuck. Those things are good, but maybe just being aware and taking the time to ask yourself if, if what I want to promise myself or what I want to move toward, is that really for health and improvement or is it, um, is it based out of something else? Um, and is this healthy Mm -hmm. for me? And so as we encourage each other across the seasons, not just this time of year toward, um, healthy and connected behaviors, I think that's really the goal, like what's healthy, it's going to look different for everybody, but also what helps a person stay connected to themselves and others the world around them and then their faith, if that's important to them, those things are, are going to be healthy. Right. Um, that's what we, that's what we want to look at. So Mm -hmm. I would just across the seasons, think about what's healthy and connective for Mm -hmm. each person. And that will look very different. Yeah. Great. I would also just add when we talked about like boundaries and you get to say no and you get to do something different if you need to, would remind you that you don't have to justify or explain yourself to anyone. Mm. And if they're demanding it, you don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you just need to do what is safe and healthy for you, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that's okay. Yeah. And, and, and then I think on the reverse side of that, Carrie, is a great point for those who are individuals. When someone sets a boundary with you over the holidays, that, that's why oh. the respecting of that is so important, right? So that it doesn't push them to feel like they have to over explain and like kind of come back. You can just say, you know what? You don't need to explain. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And thank you for, um, and thank you for being clear about what you need. Um, that helps, that helps us know how to care for you. Yes. Laura and Carrie, thank you so much. Um, I feel like I'm walking away with tons of awesome information. Um, and so and I think you've just blessed us with your your time here and sharing um, just your wisdom with us. Um, uh, so on behalf of, of Grace, enjoy just being able to care for yourself and care for others around you. So have a wonderful uh, day today and we will talk to you later. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Laura, for joining us. Thank you.